Week one, chapter two, structure of the atom. Understanding the atom is essential to the study of radiologic science. First, the interactions in the x-ray tube that produce x-rays occur at the atomic level and the nature of the x-ray photon produced depends on how an electron interacts with an atom. Second, the interactions between the x-ray photons and the human body also occur at the atomic level, determining both the radiation dose delivered and then how the body part will actually be imaged. Third, the interactions between the x-ray photons exiting the patient to produce the image interact at the atomic level of the image receptor to generate the final image. And then finally, um, other areas of study in the rad sciences also require a working knowledge of the atom. So it's best to develop a strong foundation right at the beginning of your practice in your radiology field. The basic atomic structure, the historical overview, you have Leucippus and Democritus of Abdera. Although it is believed that some basic ideas of atomism or atomic theory predate Leucippus, his name most often is associated with the earliest atomic theory. His ideas were vague and it is his student and follower Democritus of Abdera, who provided one of the most detailed and elaborate theories and is credited with expanding on and formalizing the earliest atomic theory. Democritus lived from about 460 BC to about 370 BC. The name Adam comes from the Greek word atomus, meaning indivisible. Democritus hypothesized that all things were made of tiny, indivisible structures called atoms. Democritus believed that these atoms were indestructible and differed in their size, shape, and structure. He also theorized that the nature of the object depended on its atoms. For example, sweet things are made of smooth atoms and bitter things are made of sharp atoms. Solids consist of small pointy atoms, liquids of large round atoms, and so on. Such ideas and theories were debated and carried forward for another 2,000 years. And if you look at the image on this slide, you can see the early Greek theory of the atom, where it shows um, air, earth, water, and fire. And it shows in each one of those, cold, wet, hot, and dry. The English chemist John Dalton in the early 1800s developed a sound atomic theory based not on philosophical speculation, but on scientific evidence alone. His recognition that elements combined in definite proportions to form compounds led to questions about why this happened. This inquiry led into his atomic theory. And to explain the phenomenon, he theorized that all elements were composed of tiny, indivisible, and indestructible particles called atoms. These atoms were unique to each element in their size and mass. And then from this, he theorized that compounds were formed by molecules and molecules by fixed ratios of each type of constituent atom resulting in a predictable mass. Finally, his theory stated that a chemical reaction was a rearrangement of atoms. His theory is now more than 200 years old but remains fundamentally valid. We know now that we can destroy the atom in a nuclear reaction, but his basic ideas were correct. Later, Dmitri Mendeleev advanced Dalton's work by organizing the known elements into the periodic table, which demonstrates the elements arranged in order of increasing atomic mass have similar chemical properties.
And we can see here in this figure, this is Dalton's atom model. And it is a wooden model of the atom. The next significant advancement in atomic theory came with J.J. Thompson's discovery of the electron. This discovery resulted from the scientific community's fascination with the cathode ray tube. And this was the very fascination that led Dr. Rinkin to his discovery of x-rays. Thompson was studying the well-known glowing stream that is visible when an electric current is passed through the cathode ray. This glowing stream was familiar to scientists, but no one knew what it was. Thompson discovered that the glowing stream was attracted to a positively charged electrode. Through his investigation of this phenomenon, he theorized that these glowing particles were actually negatively charged pieces of atoms, later he named electrons. Based on his understanding, he described the atom as a positively charged sphere with negatively charged electrons embedded in it, much like raisins in a plum pudding. And that's why they call this the plum pudding model. So this picture here is that plum pudding model, or also called the Thompson model. Thompson's theory was further advanced by one of his students, Ernest Rutherford. Rutherford was conducting scattering experiments by bombarding a very thin sheet of gold with alpha particles. Alpha particles are made up of two protons and two neutrons, basically the nucleus of a helium atom, and they have a positive charge. He placed a zinc sulfide screen in a ring around the gold sheet and observed the experiment with a movable microscope. With this, he observed that most particles passed straight through the sheet, but some were deflected at varying angles from slight to 180 degrees back along the path that they had traveled. So to Rutherford, this suggested that there were tiny spaces or holes at the atomic level. This space allowed most of the particles to pass through but some particles hit parts of the atoms. Such an idea contradicted his teacher's model and based on his experiments, he proposed a new, rather different model of the atom than his teacher did previously. His model resembled a tiny version of our solar system. He described a positively charged and very dense nucleus with tiny electrons orbiting in different paths. This model explained how some of the alpha particles could pass right through the gold sheet between the nuclei of the atoms and the missing and missing the orbiting electrons, whereas others were deflected. They were repelled by the strong positively charged nucleus. So his version was a radically new idea, but it did not explain a couple of the physical principles of nature. So if you see in this figure here, this is Rutherford's experiment of the scattering experiment setup, and it looks way different than that plum pudding model that we saw before. The 20th century Danish physicist Niels Bohr refined Rutherford's work, bringing us to the theory and the model of the atom with which we are most familiar. The atom is considered the basic building block of matter. Bohr's theory describes the atom as having three fundamental components, electrons, neutrons, and protons. These particles are generally referred to as the fundamental particles. The quantity of each is unique to the matter or element it composes. That is, a hydrogen atom is different from lead, which is different from tungsten, and so on. And you can find all of these in that periodic element chart. In radiology, we, we select elements for use because of their atomic structure and how they interact with the x-rays. So in this image here, you can see the Bohr model of the atom or the Bohr atom. The atom has a nucleus made up of protons and neutrons and collectively we call them the nucleons. Orbiting that nucleus are electrons and defined energy, levels and distances from that nucleus. 
shown in this image here is parts of the atom. The atom is made up of protons and neutrons in the nucleus orbited by electrons in defined energy levels. The proton is one component of the nucleus. It has one unit of positive electrical charge and a mass of 1.673 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. The neutron is the other component of the nucleus. It has no electrical charge and a mass of 1.675 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. The primary difference between protons and neutrons is that protons have a positive electrical charge. And an easy way to remember the difference is to think of the pro in proton, which suggests positive. Whereas the word neutron sounds like neutral, the neutron is in fact neutral and it has no electrical charge. Protons and neutrons compose the majority of the mass of an atom. The electron is the third principal part of the, neutron, or of the atom. It has one unit of negative electrical charge and a mass of 9.109 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. Compared with the mass of a nucleus, an electron has very little mass, yet each electron is moving extremely fast in its orbit and has significant kinetic energy. Electrical charge is a characteristic of matter, whether it is a subatomic particle, an atom, or a large object. Remember that each proton has one unit of positive charge and each electron has one unit of negative charge. Neutrons are neutral and they have no charge. If an atom has an equal number of protons and electrons, it has no net charge, which means the positives and negatives are equal and cancel out each other, making it electrically neutral. If this balance is disrupted, the atom's charge becomes positive. If there are more protons or negative, if there are more electrons. Because the protons are generally very strongly bound in the nucleus, the cause of the electrical change, which is the acquisition of a net charge, usually involves the gain or loss of electrons. If the atom gains an extra electron, the negative charges will outnumber the positives and the atom will have a net negative charge, which is called a negative ion or an anion. If the atom loses an electron, the positive charges will outnumber the negative charges and the atom will have a net positive charge, which is called a positive ion or cat ion. The nucleus is held together by a strong nuclear force creating a binding energy. This energy creates a very strong attraction in the nucleus and it overcomes even the natural tendency for like charges to repel. Um, the law of electrostatics shows that like charges repel each other and opposites attract. This is what holds the protons and neutrons together to form the nucleus of the atom. The mass of the nucleus is always less than the sum of the masses of nucleons that make up the nucleus. This difference in mass is called the mass defect and it represents the energy necessary to hold the nucleus together. That is, if one added the masses of all of the protons and neutrons of a particular atom together, which would be the atomic mass, and then compared it to the mass of the nucleus itself, the sum of the individual masses would be greater. That is because some mass is converted to energy. Remember Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared? So that is because the mass is converted to energy to hold the nucleus together. Binding energy is also a measure of the amount of energy necessary to split an atom or break it apart. If a particular, if a particle strikes the nucleus with energy equal to the nucleus's binding energy, the atom could break apart. This force is referred to as nuclear binding energy and is expressed in mega electron volts, which is capital M, 
lowercase e and capital V. Electrons orbit the nucleus at very high velocities. The force of attraction between the negatively charged electrons and positively charged protons keeps the electrons in orbit. Just as neutrons and protons are held together in the nucleus by the nuclear binding energy, the electrons are held in their orbits by electron binding energy. This electron binding energy depends on several factors including how close it is to the nucleus and how many protons are in the atom. The closer the electron is to the nucleus, the stronger is its binding energy, which is expressed in electron volts, and that is the lowercase e and capital V. Both nuclear binding energy and electron binding energy are key determinants of X-ray production. There are two types of atomic interactions in the X-ray tube that produce the X-rays, characteristic and Bremsstrahlung, or we call it Brems for short. Characteristic interactions involve the removal of orbital electrons from atoms. The penetrating strength or energy of the X-ray photon produced depends on the difference in electron binding energies of the electron shells involved. Bremsstrahlung interactions involve attraction to the nucleus of the atom and the penetrating strength or energy of the X-ray photon produced depends on nuclear binding energy. Electrons do not all occupy the same orbit at the same distance from the nucleus. An atom has defined energy levels, each at a different distance from the nucleus. These energy levels are called electron shells, and they describe a sphere around the nucleus. Electrons orbit three-dimensionally around the nucleus. They're not simply orbiting the nucleus in a single plane, as it kind of shows here, but we just illustrate it this way in the book for simplicity. You can see here in these figures, you can see the three electron shells. The first one, you can see a first shell. The second diagram, there are now two shells. And then the third one, there are now three electrons in two shells. Each electron shell of an atom is lettered, beginning with K nearest to the nucleus, and then moving outward with L, M, N, O, P, and so on. Generally, these shells fill from the K shell outward with the outermost sh shells not necessarily filling completely, just depending on the stability and the nature of the atom. Each shell has a limit to the number of electrons that it can hold. The first shell can hold only two electrons, and if an atom has three electrons, two electrons will occupy the K shell, and one will be in the L shell. An easy way to determine the maximum number of electrons that will fit in an electron shell is the formula 2n squared, in which n is the shell's number. So k becomes 1, l becomes 2, m becomes 3, and so on. The outermost shells of an atom may or may not have a full complement of electrons. Although shells can hold a certain number of electrons, they are not necessarily full. Except for the first shell, which is the K shell, a maximum of eight electrons can exist in the outermost shell of any atom, and that is called the octet rule. Some inner shells may hold more than eight electrons. For example, we have the M shell, the M shell and this can contain 18 electrons. If there are more electrons present, they will be in the N shell. If M is the outermost shell, it can hold a maximum of only eight electrons. It is important to note that the outermost shell may hold fewer, but no more than eight electrons. Think of atoms as targets, with the nucleus as the bullseye and the electron shells as the rings. Whether we are discussing atomic interactions in the x-ray tube to produce x-rays or 
interactions between human tissue atoms and x-ray photons, atoms represent the targets for interaction. There is a greater opportunity for interactions with very large complex atoms because their nucleus is larger and there are more electron shells and electrons in orbit around the nucleus. So there are more complex atoms and they're physically larger in size. There is lesser opportunity for interactions with very small and less complex atoms because the nucleus is smaller and there are fewer shells and electrons in orbit around the nucleus. So less complex atoms are physically smaller in size. Continuing to look at the, the target analogy, it would be easier for somebody to hit a target that is three feet in diameter than one that is only three inches in diameter. And this diagram here is the atom complexity. So it's showing the comparison of the complexity and size of a hydrogen atom, which is very, very small, versus a tungsten atom, which is quite a bit larger. So it would definitely be easier to penetrate that large atom than it would that small hydrogen atom. For classification and bonding, it's very important to get to understand a few definitions the atomic number, the atomic mass number, elements, and compounds. So the atomic number of an atom refers to the number of protons it contains in its nucleus. Remember that in a stable atom, the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons. So the atomic number indicates the number of electrons. The atomic mass number is the number of protons and neutrons an atom has in its nucleus. Elements are the simplest forms of substances that compose matter. Each element is made up of only one unique type of atom with an unchanging number of protons. The number of atoms that form a molecule of an element will vary. 92 different elements exist in the world and almost two dozen others have been created artificially. Familiar elements include oxygen, carbon, and chlorine. Two or more atoms bonded together form a molecule. Most naturally occurring elements exist independently in nature, that is in a pure form not combined with other elements. For example, we have iron, zinc, nickel, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and so on, all exist as pure elements. When you look at the world around you, most of what you see is in the form of chemical compounds which are combinations of elements bonded together. For example, most common substance on the Earth's surface is water, which is a compound of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. In chemical shorthand, the chemical symbol is an abbreviation of the element such as H for hydrogen. The superscript number that appears with it is the atomic mass number and the subscript number below, it is the atomic number. So if you look at this chemical shorthand diagram here, it's gonna show you the format. So the large letter is the chemical symbol. The top, the top one to the left is the atomic mass number, and then the bottom one is the atomic number. Now we move on to the isos, and this refers to the isotopes, the isotones, the isobars, and the isomers. And this is a way of classifying the elemental relationships based on the number of protons, neutrons, electrons in their constituent atoms. An isotope refers to elements whose atoms have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. An isotone refers to elements whose atoms have the same number of neutrons, but a different number of protons. An isobar refers to elements whose atoms have a different number of protons, but the same total number of protons and neutrons, which is the atomic mass number. An isomer refers to elements whose atoms have the same number of protons and neutrons, but with different amounts of energy, within their nuclei. 
Isomers have the same atomic number and the same atomic mass number, but they vary in the amount of energy within the nuclei because of differences in how the protons and neutrons are arranged. So what stays the same with isos? The names of these variants, isotope, isotone, isobar, and isomer, can serve as an easy way to remember their characteristics. The second to the last letter in the name of each suggests which characteristic stays the same. So in isotope, the second to the last letter is P. So the P reminds you that the number of protons stay the same. In isotone, the second to the last letter is N. The N reminds you that the number of neutrons stay the same. In isobar, the A is the second to the last letter. So the A reminds you that the atomic mass number is the same, which is the total number of neutrons and protons. In isomer, the E is that second to last letter, and the E reminds you that everything remains the same. So that means all of the fundamental particles of the atom remains the same, but with different, different amounts of energy. So that's a really good way to try to remember these four isos. Another means of classifying elements is according to the periodic table. The periodic table is organized by periods and groups. There are seven periods arranged as rows of the table and eight groups arranged as columns of the table. Elements in each period and group have certain characteristics. Atoms in each period have the same number of electron shells and the number of shells increase as one moves from the top row, period one, to the bottom row, period seven. This means that the atoms of the element become increasingly larger and more complex. Atoms in each group have the same number of electrons in the outermost shell. The number of electrons in the outermost shell increases as one moves from left, group one, to the right, group eight. The periodic table is not perfectly uniform. In the middle of the chart are a number of elements that, that do not easily fit in um, into the eight groups. And these elements are called the transitional metals in which the inner electron shells are being filled. These elements have some characteristics different from all the other elements. There are additional elements that do not fit into the eight groups. They are the two series of inner transitional metals, which are not shown at all on a simplified version of the periodic table. The elements with the atomic numbers 57 to 71 and 89 to 103 are the inner transitional metals, and they generally have um, special qualities. Many are radioactive. So shown in this figure here is the periodic table and note that on the periodic table, each element is abbreviated with a chemical symbol. The superscript number with the symbol is the atomic number, and the bottom number is the elemental mass. The elemental mass is the characteristic mass of an element determined by the relative abundance of the constituent atoms and their respective masses. There are two primary ways atoms bond to form molecules and subsequently more complex structures. One type of bond is called the ionic bond and the other is called the covalent bond. Ionic bonding is based on the attraction of the opposing charges. You can recall that generally atoms are electrically neutral. That is, each has the same number of protons, positive electrical charges, and electrons, negative electrical charges. When in the presence of other atoms, some atoms have a tendency to give up electrons, where others have the tendency to gain electrons. An atom that gives up an electron then has a net positive electrical charge, which is called a cation. An atom that gains an electron then has a net negative electrical charge, which is an anion. 
In an ionic bond, one of the atoms gives up an electron and the other takes the extra electron. The difference in their electrical charge attracts and bonds the two together. So it is called ionic bonding. And you can see here in this, these figures here, um, one atom gives up an electron becoming positively charged and the other takes on an electron becoming negatively charged and then the opposing charges attract the two atoms together. Covalent bonding is based on two atoms sharing electrons that then orbit both nuclei. Remember that as the electron shells of atoms fill, they do so from the one nearest the nucleus and then outward, and the outermost shells are not always full. In a covalent bond, an outermost electron from one atom begins to orbit the nucleus of another adjacent atom, so an atom that's close to it, in addition to its original nucleus. So it goes around its nucleus and then it goes around the nucleus of another atom. So think of this electron as creating a figure eight as it orbits first one nucleus and then the other. It creates like a, an, a figure eight going around both of them. The bonding of various atoms to form molecules permits the highly complex matter to exist. So in this figure here, it's showing the covalent bonding. It's showing that figure eight orbital path on the bottom and that shared electron.